targets with approved therapies and some under investigations, such as with IDH and FGFR targeting. Uh, his talk will be followed by myself, and I'll be discussing some of the less common targets, which include, for instance, HER2, uh, NTRAC, uh, and several others, which are in development uh, and perhaps uh, to follow in the future. Uh, there will be a break after that, and there'll be a discussion session where we hope to take in your questions, also discuss the mechanism of resistance to targeted agents, uh, such as in the IDH, FGFR, and uh, immuno-oncology uh, group of uh, drugs. And the final presentation will be um, by Dr. Ruth He from Georgetown. She will reflect on her observation on the, really the landmark Topaz-1 trial that was presented earlier today, uh, which reflected uh, the use of durvalumab in advanced uh, biliary tract cancer, and also touch upon various other immunotherapeutic approaches in this disease. So I'm really excited uh, to, part, to be a part of this meeting, and I hope that this will be interactive. Uh, we hope to interact with uh, the participants, and we hope to interact with the audience as well. So without any further delay, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Mitesh Borad. <clears throat> Can we have the first slide? Hi, I'm Melinda Bikini, the Director of Advocacy with the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation, and I'm also a 12-year survivor of stage 4 cholangiocarcinoma. In the past 15 years, the Foundation's efforts have made a significant impact across the globe. The work of the Foundation is only possible with the generous support of this community. Thank you to everyone who works to help us support patients and render cholangiocarcinoma a treatable disease. As a patient myself and as an advocate, I'm asking you to please think of first-line clinical trials um, in the beginning and give your patients opportunity to make that decision. And then um, after standard of care, for some reason, if they can't enter into a first-line clinical trial, please think about the clinical trials um, in second line and on for your patients to participate in. As a patient, I feel like the most significant milestone for the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation is the ability to connect more and more with the patients that are being diagnosed. We're super excited about the success of the newly diagnosed program. We're reaching an average of about 30 newly diagnosed, newly connected patients to the foundation, which means we're able to provide them with the support they need, the networks they need, um, educate them about second opinions, biomarker testing, and clinical trials, which also gives them the opportunity to have better treatment and a longer survival. Check out our website at cholangiocarcinoma.org. At the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation, we continually spread awareness through running Facebook ads, uh, Google ads. We have a group of research advocates, about 33 of them who are patients and caregivers who really um, dig into understanding the research that's going on in cholangiocarcinoma. We have a group of cholangioconnect mentors and between the mentors and the research advocates, these are the people who are talking to patients all the time and helping them understand um, about cholangiocarcinoma, about the research that's going on in cholangiocarcinoma and the opportunities that are available to them. We also have our annual conference in February this year. It will be February 23rd through the 25th in Salt Lake City. And we invite all physicians and researchers and patients and caregivers to join us there. So I invite you to come and gather the latest research that's going on, um, connect with the experts in cholangiocarcinoma, and also experience the patient and caregivers who join us and what they go through in, in their journey. The Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation has funded over $2 million worth of research fellowship grants. And um, for more information, please go to our, our website to learn about the application process and the due date, and to read about some of the grants that we have funded over the years. So let's get started. Thank you to the Medical Learning Institute, Peerview, and the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation for providing this session. Zymeworks, AstraZeneca, and Insight for providing the educational grants for the symposium. If you haven't already, please complete the pre-event survey. As a reminder, look out for additional follow-up polling during this presentation. Please submit your questions and we will answer them during the Q&A session. These are some of the disclosures.
Please visit us at peerview.com slash billary dash sf22, uh, where you can view the slides, uh, practice aids, and also download them after the event. There is an address listed here for more information. Uh, there is an email as well as a Twitter feed. Biliary cancers are anatomically distinct, and they can be divided as intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, that is cancers that arise above the hepatic bifurcation. They are extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. They can be divided into perihilar cholangiocarcinoma or Klatskin tumors that occur at the bifurcation, and then distal extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma that arise below the cystic duct. So these cancers are therefore anatomically very distinct. And in fact, as you may know, these are also distinct uh, in the, from the genetic basis. These are some of the important molecular markers that you see in intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, and gallbladder cancer. Intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma is enriched with IDH102 mutations, FGFR fusions, mutations, and amplifications, and a host of others, such as BAP1, uh, added 1A mutation. Extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma is marked by KRAS P53, PIK3CA mutation, and also importantly, HER2 mutations and amplifications. Gallbladder cancer is distinct, with almost 10 to 15% having ERB2 or ERB3 amplifications, and then a smaller number have TP53 added 1A PIK3CA mutations. So it is for these reasons that precision medicine has been highlighted in the recent NCCN practice guidelines. And this precision medicine is possible today thanks to the advent of next generation sequencing. And in fact, even today, several novel targeted agents are approved by the NCCN particularly in the second and subsequent lines of therapy. These agents include NTREC inhibitors, um, checkpoint inhibitors for uh, MSI high, and then uh, for FGFR fusions, pemigatinib and infogratinib are now FDA approved, and also on the NCCN guidelines. Ivocidinib is approved for IDH1, R132 mutations, and also now on the NCCN guidelines. Several others, uh, have also been recently uh, incorporated into the guidelines, particularly BRAF V600E, where BRAF plus BEC inhibitor combination, that is dabrafinib trimitinib, is now a part of the NCCN guidelines. Checkpoint inhibitors, uh, linvantinib and uh, pembrolizumab are category 2B listing in the NCCN guidelines at this time. So clearly, precision medicine is a, has reached prime time in unresectable and metastatic cholangiocarcinoma, particularly for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. Unfortunately, there are several shortcomings at, in terms of precision medicine for advanced biliary tract cancer. In fact, a recent assessment of 1,000 oncology providers managing patients with advanced CCA demonstrated that the majority were not confident in, the, in, in their use of targeted therapies in patients with advanced biliary tract cancer, particularly cholangiocarcinoma. Moreover, a minority of patients make it to second or subsequent lines of therapy. In the poster session, we saw this very interesting poster where 85% of patients qualify for first-line therapy, particularly gemcitabine and cisplatin, but only 46% or less than half go on to second-line therapy, and in fact, only 17% go to third or subsequent lines of, treat of therapy. The median time of treatment was only 3.2 months first line and 2.7 in the second and subsequent lines of therapy. So clearly, biliary tract cancers and cholangiocarcinoma represent areas of great unmet need. And in this session, Dr. Borad will provide a summary of available targeted therapies in this talk. There is yet another important shortcoming that is clinical trials. Very few patients with biliary tract cancers enroll in clinical trials. In fact, at this time, it is believed only three to 5% of adult cancer patients with biliary tract cancer will enroll in all trials. There are several reasons for this. One is the molecular heterogeneity of this tumor. Uh, often these patients have liver dysfunction, 
Uh, therefore, these patients often don't qualify. And then there's a relative rarity of this disease, which presents an important challenge for clinical enrollment. Dr. He and I will provide a summary of pro promising targeted and immune-based therapies, including precision changing the data from Topaz-1 for biliary tract cancer. Moreover, we will hear from patients of different aspects of their treatment journey. So let's get started with Dr. Mitesh Barad from Mayo Clinic. Thank you, Dr. Javli, for that kind introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with everyone this evening at the Peerview Live uh, Symposium at ASCO GI 2022. Um, I will take stock of the arsenal as highlighted here, highlighting new approvals, emerging evidence, and ongoing clinical trials pertaining to FGFR and IDHS targets in advanced cholangiocarcinoma. As we all know, a lot has happened during uh, the pandemic and things didn't remain quiet in cholangiocarcinoma, as you will see. Starting with the pathway, the fibroblast growth factor receptor pathway is a tyrosine kinase pathway, uh, which <laughs> requires ligand receptor binding leading to dimerization of the receptors and activation of a downstream cascade that leads to the hallmarks of cancer, such as growth, metastasis, angiogenesis, and invasion. We'll start off with a case. Uh, I highlight the case of a patient in her mid-40s who has metastatic cholangiocarcinoma with bilobar liver disease and pulmonary metastases. Uh, she is symptomatic, as you can see uh, here. Uh, blood counts are not uh, detrimental in a way that therapies cannot be used, and other laboratory parameters are such that there are not limitation of uh, therapies either. The patient received first-line gemcitabine and cisplatin, but unfortunately had disease progression. Uh, this patient had NGS testing done and was found to have an FGFR2 BICC1 fusion. Well, what I'll show you will hopefully highlight what we would try to do for these types of patients. So a landmark study was the FIGHT202 trial looking at pemigatinib, which is an FGFR inhibitor in locally advanced and metastatic cholangiocarcinoma patients. The study had three cohorts. Cohort A had 100 patients. Uh, these are patients who had FGFR2 fusions or rearrangements. And then two smaller cohorts were studied as well. Cohort B looked at patients with other FGF and FGFR pathway alterations, primarily mutations and amplifications. And cohort C were patients that, which did not have any uh, alterations. Patients were treated with pemigatinib, 13.5 milligrams daily dosing for two weeks on and one week off. The primary endpoint was overall response rate, which was independently confirmed. Uh, as we can see in the primary and current analysis, the response rate is in the mid 30% range. Some complete responses, about two to 4%, largely partial responses. The duration of response is in the eight month range. Progression-free survival is in the seven month range. Responders do much better than responders. This is not uh, surprising, of course. Uh, this is the case with most therapies where that happens. And survival in responders was 30 months, non-responders 13.7 months. These data led to the FDA approval of pemigatinib and approval in the EU uh, about a year later. Uh, so this was the first drug specifically approved for cholangiocarcinoma in April 2020. Shown again here are the overall survival data. For, so patients with uh, fusions in cohort A had 17.5 month overall survival, responders 30.1 months, compared to non-responders 13.7 months. Uh, this was much more significant compared to Cohort B, which was other FGF, FGFR pathway alterations, and cohort C, which were 
patients which did not have any alterations. Uh, this could, of course, be somewhat prognostic too, so uh, do keep that in mind when interpreting this data. Quality of life was also measured, and in patients with progressive disease shown in red, there was deterioration in quality of life, whereas there was sustenance of quality of life in those patients who had some form of clinical benefit. Moving on to infogratinib, which is the other FGFR inhibitor in this space. Uh, again, a study somewhat over 100 patients. Response rate uh, was 23.1% uh, in terms of independently confirmed response rate. Duration of response was five months. Progression-free survival, similar to what I showed with pemigatinib, 7.3 months. Overall survival, 12.2 months. Infragratinib was dosed at 125 milligrams daily for 21 days uh, every 28 days, so three out of four weeks until disease progression. Uh, the other endpoints besides the primary endpoint of response rate were progression-free survival, overall survival, safety, and pharmacokinetics. So again, another option for patients uh, who have FGFR2 fusions or rearrangements who have previously received or are intolerant to platinum-based therapy. We can see here that uh, there are a number of other agents in development, futibatinib uh, being the one that's maybe the most advanced after the two that I showed you. Uh, in a study, again, over 100 patients, response rate over 40%, a median progression-free survival of nine months, and overall survival of 21.7 months. Derazantinib, a lower response rate at 21%, but similar progression-free survival at eight months, and median overall survival at 16 months. Uh, data from erdafitinib is somewhat limited given its limited evaluation thus far um, outside of bladder cancer. A number of first-line studies are ongoing shown uh, for infogratinib, pemigatinib, and futibatinib which would compare the drug versus gemcitabine and cisplatin. Uh, as I highlighted, infragratinib and pemigatinib are already FDA approved and can be clinically used by anyone, anywhere, uh, <coughs> barring, of course, any insurance considerations. Futibatinib received breakthrough designation in April 2021, and we will eagerly be awaiting it to join the infragratinib and pemigatinib uh, approvals, hopefully in the near future. Going back to the case, uh, this patient, as I highlighted, had an FGFR2 BICC1 fusion. The FDA-approved options would be infragratinib and pemigatinib, uh, and these could be considered a standard, a standard of care options for, for this patient. Looking at adverse events with FGFR inhibition, so the small molecule inhibitors don't only hit FGFR2, but also target FGFR1, 3, and to some degree 4, and this leads to on quote-unquote target uh, toxicities, but these are really off-target at, uh, at from a purist standpoint. The toxicities uh, would involve, <clears throat> as shown here, on target on the right uh, and off target on the left, which would be largely due to uh, general kinase inhibition, predominantly amongst them, VEGF receptor inhibition, which would be things like hypertension, proteinuria, fatigue, and arthralgias. Looking at the FGFR specific toxicities, hyperphosphatemia results from FGFR1 and 4 inhibition. You also get FGFR2 related toxicities such as nail changes, onycholysis being the predominant amongst these, uh, alopecia, uh, mucosal toxicities, other skin toxicities, such as a, a rash, and importantly, ocular toxicities, ranging from dry eye to retinal detachment. Management of hyperphosphatemia. Uh, this is sort of a new toxicity that has been introduced into this space with FGFR inhibitors. 
And based on the level of phosphate, one can manage this with a uh, low phosphate diet, uh, ranging to having to hold the drug, and in between you might use phosphate binding agents such as sevalimer. Consulting a nutritionist can also be helpful if there are challenges for particular patients. Ocular toxicities are particularly worrisome, especially if they are serious, uh, with things such as retinal detachment. As you can see, things such as cataracts, dry eyes, central serous retinopathy, and retinal detachment have been noted with all of the FGFR inhibitors utilized thus far. Uh, infragratinib and pemigatinib um, have these toxicities, and given that they are FDA approved and would be used, these should be kept in mind. Uh, management of these toxicities would range from holding the drug and dose reducing, um, to having the guidance of an ophthalmologist uh, to, to help manage these toxicities. I would recommend all patients who get FGFR inhibitors have an ophthalmologist involved in their care uh, from the outset. Similarly, with dermatological toxicities, you have paronychia, onycholysis, alopecia, hand foot syndrome, stomatitis, calcinosis cutis, and calciphylaxis being the range of spectrum of toxicities that can be observed in these patients. These can be managed with things such as iodine application to steroids, uh, to antibiotics, and in severe cases, drug discontinuation and dose reductions. Again, having a dermatolo dermatologist be involved in the management of these patients, likely from the outset, would be advisable. Moving on to the other target uh, for which now there are new standard of care options. Uh, we have IDH1, isocitrate dehydrogenase 1. Uh, this is found in about 15 or so percent patients with cholangiocarcinoma, predominantly intrahepatic. Ivocidinib is a drug that has undergone phase three evaluations now compared to placebo in a second line setting as shown here. Uh, study was Conducted looking at ivocidinib, 500 daily versus placebo, two to one randomization. Uh, patients had advanced metastatic cholangiocarcinoma with IDH1 mutant status, good ECOG performance score zero or one. One or two prior therapies, uh, patients would have to have had measurable disease and the study had about 180 patients as shown here. Median progression-free survival was 2.7 versus 1.4 months. This was the primary endpoint in terms of independent radiology review. While these numbers are not <coughs> that significant, uh, they were statistically significant. Uh, median overall survival was 10.3 versus 7.5 months. This was numerically superior, but not statistically significant. Uh, given that crossover was allowed, this could have certainly played a significant uh, role in this outcome. Six month overall survival rate was 69 versus 57%, and 12 month overall survival was 43 versus 36%. Again, shown here are the overall survival and progression free survival numbers. 10.3 versus 7.5 for overall survival, not statistically significant, and 2.7 versus 1.4 for progression-free survival, statistically significant. There was also an analysis called rank-preserving structural failure time to account for crossover. Using <clears throat> this methodology, uh, this was significant, significant with a hazard ratio of 0.49, p-value less than 0 0.0001. Uh, however, from a purist standpoint, again, uh, the <coughs> data was not statistically significant, but certainly trending in the right direction. Collectively, these data led to the FDA approval of ivacidinib in patients with cholangiocarcinoma who have received platinum-based uh, therapies who have IDH1 mutations. In terms of treatment adverse 
emergent adverse events. Ivocidinib is generally an extremely well-tolerated drug. Uh, we do see some degree of gastrointestinal toxicity with nausea, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. Uh, also noted is some cough and anemia, which is more significant uh, than placebo. Dose reductions were uncommon. Uh, as you can see, 2.6 versus 0% uh, of patients. And interruptions were somewhat more common, but certainly not significant, 26.3 versus 16.9%. Other targeted agents and strategies uh, in this paradigm are olaparib and nirvalumab, combination olaparib and seralacetib, and a number of other IDH1 inhibitors, LY3410738 and HMPL-306 being studied in early phase studies. As we can see in the last two years, uh, there has been a lot in the FDA approval space, but the journey started in 2017 with disease agnostic approvals for pembrolizumab in microsatellite unstable tumors, as well as tumor mutation burden greater than 10 uh, tumors. Now we have infragratinib, pemigatinib, and ivacidinib, all FDA approved, futibatinib uh, waiting in the wings, and a large cadre of agents targeting a number of agents that will be highlighted uh, that will undergo further investigation. I would like to highlight a patient journey that you will see a video of in a moment. Um, precision oncology is very real for patients and Matt will very eloquently uh, <laughs> state his patient journey. It's terrific to see uh, these types of experiences incorporated into these meetings to get a patient perspective of precision medicine impact uh, in the field. The most amazing thing about this is that at the time that I had my molecular testing done, there were there was nothing in the report of any value to me. There were no clinical trials that I qualified for. There was nothing really substantial. Um, that I could that I could act upon based on the report, and within two short years, um, this drug had become available and ended up saving my life. I I boldly say that I'm cured, um, and I I firmly believe that uh, biomarker testing today is essential for glangiocarcinoma patients. Um, in the past five or six years, there are now several drugs that are targeted at cholangiocarcinoma based on biomarkers that are found um, and more in the pipeline. So um, when I was diagnosed, biomarker testing was not routine. Um, it's becoming more routine and it's something that, that people need to really advocate for and insist uh, that it be done because it, it can extend or potentially cure um, for some people. Thank you, Matt, for that very poignant and detailed uh, journey of your course and experience with precision medicine. Uh, it is e extremely important to get the patient perspective uh, in meetings like this. And we, again, want to thank Matt for kindly sharing uh, his experience in this regards. Uh, there, is a lot more to do in precision medicine as you will see in the remainder of this uh, symposium. Uh, with that being said, I will hand it back over to Dr. Javli to take uh, things from here. I'd like to thank the audience for their attention and for the kind invitation to be part of this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. My topic is tailoring treatment approaches with emerging strategies in biliary tract cancer with a focus of HER2 and other molecularly driven targets. So this complicated figure explains some of the molecular alterations in biliary tract cancer that are actionable even at this time. So we heard about FGFR2 fusions 
We heard about IDH1 and two mutations, but there are several other targets, fortunately, in biliary tract cancer. These include, for instance, FGFR mutations. These occur in 3 to 5% of patients. Other include herb B family, which is, of course, EGFR, HER2, and HER3. PI3 kinase, AKT, and toraxis. You have the VENT pathway and angiogenesis. So several of these are being targeted in biliary tract cancer at this time, and I shall discuss some of the preliminary data. FGFR2 mutations, as I mentioned, are uncommon, but do occur in cholangiocarcinoma, particularly intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. So these are the, the data from Infigratinib, the pivotal 2204 trial, where a handful of patients with either mutations or amplifications were enrolled. Uh, no partial response was seen in the study in that subgroup. However, st disease stability did occur. Similar results were noted with pemigatinib for the treatment of FGFR alterations in the FI202 trial. Uh, this study enrolled 20 patients with FGFR2 mutations or amplifications. Again, there was no partial response. However, disease stability did occur in a significant number, about 46% of these patients. At this meeting, the pivotal data from the Derzantinib trial were presented, the FIDIS-1 trial. And in this trial, patients with FGFR mutations or amplifications were enrolled. And the, this Kaplan-Meier curve reflects the progression-free survival for patients treated with Derzantinib uh, who had FGFR mutations or amplifications. As you can see, the progression-free survival was 7.3 months, quite similar to what you get with fusions. Activity was seen across a host of mutations and amplifications, and, and these disease stability and responses were prolonged. Partial responses that are marked here on the slide on the lower right were also noted with derazantinib with FGFR mutations. I'm highlighting here two novel agents which seem to have promising activity with FGFR mutations. The one above is the relay agent, Relay4008. In their first in human study, uh, 4008 induced radiographic tumor regressions across several FGFR alterations. And these included mutations and amplifications and fusions. And interestingly, these also included mutations uh, that were acquired secondary to prior uh, FGFR inhibitor therapy. Some of these mutations are reflected in the vertical bars that you see in pink. The other novel agent is a transthera agent, TT00420. This is a multi-targeted uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor that focuses on FGFR. And several of these patients had disease stability with two experiencing PR. This drug is now ha having a fast-track designation for patients with cholangiocarcinoma, and we look forward to seeing its results. Next, I'm going to present a patient case. This is a patient from my practice. Uh, he's an elderly gentleman who presented with obstructive jaundice. Uh, there was a ill-defined mass that you see on the um, CT scan uh, from the upper left that was seen in the set. It was seen centrally, about five centimeters in size. This mass invaded the bile ducts as well as the portal vein. So therefore, this mass was considered unresectable at diagnosis. The patient received gemcitabine and cisplatin for almost uh, six months or 12 rounds. And you see the uh, CT scan on the upper right, which shows a regression in the mass. The patient then underwent hepatectomy. This was an extended left hepatectomy along with lymph node dissection and cholecystectomy. The final pathology showed invasive, poorly differentiated intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma uh, extens with extension to the hilum the left hepatic duct, the common hepatic duct, the hepatic vein. Unfortunately, the anti-tumor effect and the pathology was relatively limited, but the margins were negative. And the patient did well for a while. Unfortunately, five months later, as you see in, this, in the CT scan on the lower left, there was recurrence. So there was oligometastatic disease that was seen uh, in a relatively short time after surgical resection and adjuvant therapy. 
we performed the liver biopsy and the liver biopsy confirmed adenocarcinoma and the patient was started on fall fox. Unfortunately, the, at the first restaging itself, there was progressive disease noted on fall fox. So my question here would be, what would we do next? We shall visit this case later during this presentation. The ERB-B pathway has been extensively invest investigated in biliary tract cancer. This includes, of course, ERB-B1 or EGFR. This was investigated in the pivotal bingo trial, which included cetuximab. So this trial was gemcitabine oxaliplatin plus or minus cetuximab, and there was no survival improvement in the study arm with cetuximab as compared with the control arm with gemox alone. Similarly, there was no benefit with panitumumab or arlotinib, which was also investigated in a randomized study in Asia. Subgroup analysis in some of these trials showed an improved progression-free survival. However, there was no improvement in overall survival. And therefore, these agents are not a part of standard practice at this time. HER2 alterations occur in a fraction of patients with biliary tract cancer, particularly gallbladder cancer. And therefore, these have been investigated with trastuzumab. Unfortunately, the warlitinib study, warlitinib is a pan-EGFR in, 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 inhibitor that was found to have no improvement in progression-free survival or overall survival in a randomized study recently. Trastuzumab deruxtecan is an antibody drug conjugate that was investigated in a basket trial, uh, the, the pan-tumor 2 trial, and we will discuss its results shortly. Neratinib, which is a pan-HER tyrosine kinase inhibitor, the activity uh, was seen, however, it was comparable with current standards of care, including chemotherapy. A promising agent that I will discuss is Zanidaramab, or ZW25, which is a bispecific antibody, which has completed a phase one trial and is currently in a pivotal trial being investigated for the management of biliary tract cancer with HER2 amplification. So first, HER2 pathway investigation with pertuzumab and crustuzumab. So this was investigated in the My Pathway basket trial, and one of the arms of this basket trial was metastatic biliary tract cancer. So patients enrolled in this, in this trial had to have received prior systemic chemotherapy, typically gemcitabine and cisplatin, or gemcitabine and oxaliplatin. These patients were required to have HER2 amplification or overexpression of both, and a good ECOG performance status. These patients were then treated with pertuzumab with a loading dose followed by a maintenance dose and similarly with trastuzumab. So this was a pertuzumab and trastuzumab combination similar to what is being used now in breast cancer. The study results were reported recently and after a median follow-up of 8.1 months, nine out of these 39 patients had a objective response and as we shall see in the next slide, these responses were sustained. The treatment-related grade three adverse events were relatively few and occurred in a minority of patients. And these included liver function abnormalities and uh, such as uh, elevated enzymes, alkaline phosphatase. There were no treatment-related serious adverse events or grade four events of death. So the treatment was overall very well tolerated. So these are the results of the trastuzumab and pertuzumab trial in the My Pathway study. And the results are grouped according to the site of origin. This includes intrahepatic, extrahepatic cholangio, gallbladder cancer, and uh, <clears throat> ampullary, as well as undesignated. Although activity was seen in, in all of these cancer types, the most promising signal seems to be in gallbladder cancer, where objective responses occurred in a, in a significant number of patients, although this was clearly uh, a relatively small study. These responses were sustained. So the disease control rate that you note here is, uh, is, is high to the order of almost 70%, the duration of response being as high as seven months, uh, and progression-free survival was also very encouraging in this refractory disease setting. So zanidaramab or ZW25 is a very interesting bispecific HER2 targeted antibody. So it has a trastuzumab binding domain and a pertuzumab binding domain. And it has a very interesting mechanism of action, which includes binding to HER2 across a range of expression levels. 
these could be low as well as high and this eventually leads to HER2 receptor clustering, internalization and down regulation, thereby leading to inhibition of growth factor dependent and independent tumor cell proliferation and it also has an immune ADCC effect which can be exploited in the clinic. Zenitinibab has been investigated now in biliary tract cancer in a phase one trial with very promising results. As you can see in the waterfall plot, a majority of patients experience disease stability or response. In fact, the response rate was 5%, the duration of response was 7.4 months, disease control rate was 65%. And these impressive data support the pivotal trial, the Horizon BTC01 international trial, which will hopefully have an encouraging signal leading to approval of this agent. Back to the patient case. We recall that this patient was treated with gemcitabine cisplatin, had surgery, recurred, and there was treated with Falfox with a very suboptimal response. So this patient then underwent next generation sequencing, and the next generation sequencing revealed that there was HER2 amplification, which was also confirmed on FISH, as well as by immunostochemistry. So the patient was then enrolled on the Zanidaramab or ZW25 trial, uh, which resulted in a very good response. All that you see on the uh, CT scan on the lower left, this was oligometastatic disease. It did respond uh, with a partial response and the treatment was continued for a significant length of time. In fact, almost close to two years. And the patient was then referred to surgical resection, uh, rendering them NED uh, with no further evidence of disease. So these are encouraging results and we hope for promising results in the pivotal trial as well. Let us go on to other HER2-directed agents. Now, of course, trastuzumab deruxtecan has, has very promising signal in uh, breast cancer as well as recently in, in colorectal cancer. So this uh, slide represents the basket study of trastuzumab deruxtecan, which, as you know, is an antibody drug conjugate, conjugate of trastuzumab along with the topo-1 isomerase inhibitor, Exatican. Responses were seen across a host of tumor types. Perhaps the most encouraging response were seen in biliary tract cancer, both in gallbladder cancer as well as in cholangiocarcinoma. Another impressive result was at yet another basket trial, the phase two ROAR trial. Uh, the ROAR trial is looking at a variety of mutations, including BRAF V600E, and this particular arm investigated BRAF v 600 e mutated biliary tract cancer. So patients were treated with BRAF v 600 e inhibitors, in, in this case BRAF plus MEK inhibitor, dabrafinib and trametinib. And as you can see, a very impressive response rate was seen. Majority of patients experiencing either partial response to stable disease. The overall response rate was 22% with investigator assessment, 20% by independent review. Progression-free survival was nine months and median overall survival was 14 months uh, in this arm with uh, patients who had already received chemotherapy and were refractory. So this combination has therefore now made it to the NCCN guidelines. There has been a tumor agnostic approval for TREK fusions, and TREK fusions, as you, re, as you recall, uh, lead to a variety of downstream activation pathways, such as the PI3 kinase, the MAP kinase pathway, PLC gamma pathways. TREK alterations occur rarely, but have been described in biliary tract cancer. And for them, larotrectinib and entrectinib are two TREK inhibitor options that are approved and result in spectacular results. Another important target that I'd like to discuss is DNA repair, particularly DNA repair inhibition by PARP inhibitors. In fact, 20 to 25% of patients with biliary tract cancer have DNA repair defects, which result in homologous recombination repair deficiency. Alterations in HRD genes create a vulnerability. This can be targeted by DNA repair inhibitors. PARP1 and PARP2 are members of the PARP family that are furthest along in development, and some of these agents are currently approved. PARP inhibition targets synthetic lethality in biliary tract cancers that have DNA repair genetic alterations. There are two trials that I wish to highlight. One is a phase two trial of Olaparib in advanced biliary tract cancer 
expressing or aberrant DNA repair. And the schema of this trial is reflected below, where patients with DNA repair defects receive 300 milligrams twice daily olaparib. If responses are seen in the first group of patients, then additional cohort is accrued and the treatment is continued until progression uh, or, or toxicity. The study is being conducted by the accrue group and is actively enrolling at this time. There is another phase two trial of niraparib that targets BAP1 and other DDR or DNA damage response um, uh, genes in, in cancers, including biliary tract cancer. And results of that study are also eagerly awaited. There are several other trials that are now being investigated in uh, biliary tract cancer. One includes PIK3C or AKT. These can now be targeted with PIK3 inhibitors, such as copancilib or AKT inhibitors. Rispofusions, RNF43 mutations occur rarely, but can be targeted effectively with porcupine inhibitors. KRAS is an important target, really the Achilles heel in many cancers. As you know, there is an effective KRAS G12C uh, targeted therapy. G12D is also under investigation at this time. ALK alterations occur commonly in lung cancer, uncommonly, but do occur in, in biliary tract cancer, and now can be targeted with crizotinib and seretinib. So as you can see, there are several targets in biliary tract cancer, although these may be rare uh, alterations in a rare tumor, they can be targeted using basket design, and hopefully we shall see several of these results in the next couple of years. All right, that was, uh, it was exciting to discuss these uh, targeted therapies and molecularly and molecular sequencing in biliary tract cancer. I want to welcome uh, uh, Ruth and Mitesh again, and Flavio, thank you for holding the fort for us live. I'm going to start with a question for Ruth. <clears throat> Clearly, um, uh, mole uh, molecular sequencing is an uh, important part uh, of treatment for biliary tract cancer. Can you uh, highlight us about your own practice trend? How often do you uh, biopsy patients or re-biopsy them if they don't have enough tissue because tissue is always the issue here? Uh, do you frequently use liquid biopsies? Uh, do you re-biopsy? So these are multiple questions really surrounding on uh, around uh, tissue acquisition. Yes. Um, I, I, the data presented by Dr. Board and Dr. Javali really reflect a lot of energy from the field and um, precision med medicine. So uh, actually in practice, I um, uh, profile every patient with advanced biliary cancer. Currently, uh, patients who is resectable and we're not profiling those patients yet. But any patients who need systemic therapy, I profile them. Um, if they have, if I've treated them with FGF4 inhibitor or IDH1 inhibitor, if they have developed resistance, um, disease pro uh, had disease progression, I will re-biopsy. I've tried to use liquid biopsy, and um, sometimes I'm able to um, to identify the finding from tissue biopsy, but not always. Um, I, it, we, we do, we collaborate with basic researcher and try to isolate uh, circulating tumor cells and grow them and grow organoids. And so it's a very interesting area of research for us. Thank you very much, Ruth. So a practical question, if the patient is referred to Georgetown and has already had a biopsy, not enough tissue for biopsy, not enough tissue for sequencing, first line, would you re-biopsy? Well, uh, you, you said there's not enough tissue for biopsy. Then not I enough would... tissue for sequencing. Yeah. Um, well, yes, I, I would. Yeah. I would read biopsy. Thank you. I mean, I mean, I think that's really an important point that you make, Dr. He. We get a lot of patients referred from the community. Even now, you have FNAs and, you know, sometimes suboptimal biopsies. And the message for appropriate biopsy technique and the importance of molecular sequencing, uh, the, the invaluable information that can be lost by inadequate biopsies. I think we have to sort of break away from that mold and try to try to rebiopsy, try to get tissue even when sometimes it's uncomfortable to talk a patient into another biopsy just a few weeks after a prior inadequate biopsy. 
So uh, my next question is for you, uh, Dr. Barad. Uh, you highlighted very eloquently uh, the activity of FGFR inhibitors in cholangiocarcinoma. Now, unfortunately, I would say that although this, these news are, uh, the, some of the data you showed were exciting, the progression-free survival uh, response rate were still quite limited. Uh, what is your approach in the case of uh, FGFR resistance? What, hap what do you do after you treat a patient with infragratinib and pemigratinib, and then you see progression? Uh, what is your personal approach, and what would be your approach to our colleagues? In the, in, what would be your recommendation for people in the community who would not have the access to the trials that you have, for instance, at Mayo Clinic? Yeah, I, I mean, as you clearly highlighted, uh, these are active drugs, but they're not curative, and the responses are not as durable as agents such as, say, NTREC inhibitors. Uh, resistance will occur in the vast majority of patients, including uh, some who develop primary resistance. Uh, infragratinib and pemigratinib, which are the two FDA-approved agents, um, given the binding sites of the molecules to FGFR2, uh, do have some escape mechanisms uh, that are quite common <clears throat> on the pathway itself. So you will see polyclonal FGFR2 mutations that will emerge uh, in, as, with these drugs uh, quite commonly. And then there'll be other mechanisms that are parallel pathways such as the HER pathway or RAS pathway uh, MET pathway and others um, that could be other escape mechanisms. Fortunately, futabatinib can address most of these mutations, barring one of the gatekeeper mutations, uh, the V564 uh, family. Uh, so we're, we're hoping this drug becomes available in the near future, and uh, you, you may be able to still get uh, efficacy with ongoing FGFR targeting uh, if you were on hemigatinib or infragratinib, you would want to assess with liquid biopsy or repeat and or tissue biopsy uh, as you highlighted earlier. Thank you. Uh, we may just have a few seconds left before uh, we go over to Dr. He. Uh, Flavio, can you quickly summarize if there's an integration, a way to integrate targeted therapy with surgery? eagerly anticipating all this to be kind of sorted out so that we know which drug we can use in the sort of locally advanced or downstaging setting. So it's very exciting that we have multiple options. And so I'm looking forward to working together with this group and others. Uh, I think the big question is going to be, why don't we start profiling at diagnosis for all patients? Because I think the more we learn, the quicker we'll be able to apply these technologies. So I'm, I'm a as I, as I always say, I, I feel like I'm back in my uh, junior high basketball team and say, put me in, coach. Wonderful. We look forward to working with you, Flavio. And, and uh, we really need surgeons like yourself who think beyond surgery, look at the, the global picture. So I think we're going to turn over now to Dr. He. Dr. He, I'm really looking forward to your presentation on immuno-oncology in cholangiocarcinoma. Thank you. Good evening. Hi, I'm Dr. Ruth He. I'm a GI medical oncologist working at the Georgetown University Hospital. I want to thank PeerView to invite me to give a talk on focus on checkpoint inhibitors and novel therapies in biliary cancer. Studies across different solid, solid tumors have shown a improved immune response to immune checkpoint inhibitors in patients with high mutation Mutate tumor mutation burden, or tumor with mismatch repair deficiency. The median tumor mutation burden was 2.7 mutation per meg megabytes, and only 5% of biliary cancer have high tumor mutation burden as defined as 10 or more mutation per megabytes. Only 1 to 3% of biliary cancer are microsatellite unstable with mismatch repair deficiency. Anti-PD-1 antibody, pembrolizumab and dostotlumab have been FDA approved for tumor with mismatch repair deficiency. Those tumor are, have microsatellite instable tumors. Pembrolizumab was also FDA approved for patients with high tumor mutation burdens 
defined as 10 or more mutations per megabytes. As you can see, majority of biliary cancer do not have high tumor mutation burden and they do not have mismatch repair deficiency. Immunotherapies are investigated in biliary cancer. PD-1 antibody pembrolizumab was initially evaluated in biliary cancer in two basket clinical trials, Kino 028 and Kino 158. Kino 028 um, include exclusively PDL1 positive solid tumors. And 24 patients enrolled was enrolled in Kino 028. The response rate was 13% and a durable median duration of response not reached, ranging 24 months to 66 months plus. Um, Keynote 158 is a larger basket trial, uh, enrolled 108 biliary cancer patients. Most of those patients were heavily treated previously. The response rate was reported to be 5.8%. Dura median duration of response not reached, ranging 24 months to 50 months plus. And the data from this two basket trial suggest um, immune checkpoint inhibitors, anti PD1 therapy, uh, is effective, can induce durable response in a subset of patients with biliary cancer. Anti-PD-1 antibody nivolumab monotherapy was studied in a phase two study and 46 biliary cancer patients were enrolled. The response rate was 22% and disease control rate 50% by investigator uh, review. The response rate was lower at 11% by blinded independent center review. 59% of patients carry PDL1 positive biliary cancer in the study. The PDL1 expression was associated with increased PFS in this study. Interestingly, PDL1 expressed on tumor cells in nine out of 10 investigator assessed responders and all five century reviewed responders. All responders were MSS, microsatellite stable. To improve the response rate, combination immunotherapy targeting multiple uh, immune checkpoint molecules are under investigation in biliary cancer. The combination of nivolumab and ipilimumab was evaluated in pretreated rail tumor. In this study, 39 biliary cancer patients were enrolled. The response rate was 23%, disease control rate was 44%. The combination was quite well tolerated with the reported grade three, four toxicities of 15%. The median duration of response was not reached, reached ranging 2.5 months to 23 months plus. The results compel favorably to single agent anti-PD-1 therapy and um, Currently, a larger phase two study is undergoing, is undergoing uh, to evaluate the combination of nivolumab and ipilimumab as a first-line therapy in advanced biliary cancer. Devalumab was the first anti-PD-L1 antibody tested in biliary cancer. The uh, devalumab, with or without tremenumumab, was evaluated in a early phase one, two study. In this study, the value map resulted a re overall response rate of 5%, disease control rate of 16.7%. The combination of the value map, treminumumab, resulted objective response of 11%, disease control rate of 32%. And uh, grade three, four AE was reported to be 19%, in the Valumab map monotherapy arm, 23% in the combination arm. Now let's look at a real case. And this is a patient, 74-year-old white male, presented with unintended weight loss and fatigue. CT scan showed multiple liver masses 
with lodges measuring 7 times 6.4 cm in right hepatic lobe and multiple enlarged periaortic lymph nodes. Ultrasound-guided liver mass biopsy showed poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma, IDH stain favoring intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. This patient has a PS of 1 and normal good organ functions. His, his CN99 was not elevated. It was measured at 20. This patient has metastatic cholangiocarcinoma, not a candidate for resection. The current standard therapy for first-line treatment is a combination of gemcitabine plus cisplatinine based on the ABCO2 study. The combination of the value map with cisplatinine gemcitabine was evaluated in a phase two study. And uh, patients received the value map plus gemcis combination had a promising objective response rate of 73%. In that cohort of 45 patients, the median PFS was 11.9 months and the OS was 20.7 months. And uh, the treatment was quite well tolerated. The promising data led to the randomized phase three study, TOPAS-1 study. In TOPAS-1 study, patients with advanced cholangiocarcinoma recurrent biliary cancer are randomized to receive the value map every three weeks with GEMSYS up to eight cycles, followed by monotherapy, the value map every four weeks until disease progression or other discontinuation criteria, or placebo every three weeks plus GEMSYS up to eight cycles, followed by monotherapy every four weeks until disease progression or other discontinuation criteria. This, the study primary endpoint was overall survival. TOPAS-1 study met the primary endpoint. The, the, the median overall survival was improved uh, in patients received a combination of the biomap plus GEMSYS in comparison to placebo plus GEMSYS with a hazard ratio of 0.8. Now let's look at the survival rate at 18 months and 24 months. At 18 months, 35% of patients treated with the value map plus GEMSYS were alive. 25% of patients treated with chemo combination were alive. At two years, near 25% of patients treated with the value map plus GEMSYS were alive. Only 10% treated with chemo combination were alive. This data, um, suggest a long-term benefit of the value map plus GEMSYS in patients with cholangiocarcinoma. The overall survival benefit of the value map and the gemcitabine cisplatinine was observed in a uh, subgroup analysis. And you can see the benefit uh, consistently favored the combination uh, in all subgroups analyzed. The survival benefit of the value map plus gemcitabine cisplatinine was observed in PDL1 cutoff subgroup analysis. And this data suggests the combination of the value map and uh, plus gemcis may benefit PDL1 high or PDL1 low um, biliary cancer. Topaz 1 study also met the secondary study endpoint progression-free survival. And the combination of the Viomap plus GEMSYS resulted a improved PFS with a hazard ratio of 0.75. The objective response rate with the triplet was higher in comparison to the chemo combination. And uh, patients treated with the Viomap and GEMSYS uh, in, in the arm, there were seven patients achieved a complete response. Only two patients achieved a complete response in the chemo combination alone arm. The median duration of response and proportion of patients in response at nine months and 12 months were higher in the, the Viomap GEMSYS combination in com comparing to the placebo plus GEMSYS. Now let's look at 
uh, uh, adverse events and treatment exposure. The leading duration of exposure of all three agents um, were longer uh, in the triplet arm compared to placebo plus gem cis arm. If you look at the adverse events, any AE, any grade 3 AE, any grade 3 treatment-related AE, any AE leading to discontinuation are very similar between the two arms. You do see more immune-mediated AEs in the Devayumab plus Gemsys arm. However, most of those AEs are, were grade 1, 2 AEs. So in summary, addition of Devayumab to uh, Gemsys did not add additional toxicities to that reported uh, by chemotherapy treatment alone. Um, so let's look at other combinations. Preclinical studies has um, provided strong rationale to combine anti-VEGF therapy with immune checkpoint inhibitors. Levetinib is a small molecule inhibitor of VEGF, PDGF, FGF, RET, and KIT. Um, it has shown activity in um, advanced biliary cancer, the combination of levetinib plus pembrolizumab in this phase 2 leap 2 study showed um, early data showed uh, objective response rate of 10%. Based on this data, a larger study is enrolling to uh, validate the activity of levetinib plus pembrolizumab in biliary cancer. Another exciting drug is arginase inhibitor. INCB001128 is a small molecule arginase inhibitor that restore arginine level and alleviate myeloid-derived de uh, immunosuppression in the tumor uh, microenvironment. Uh, a phase 1-2 study evaluated different doses of this arginase inhibitor in combination with gemcitabine and cisplatinine. The phase two study uh, will enroll patients in a, as an expansion cohort. And you can see the, the early data from this study showed a objective response rate of 24%, disease control rate of 66%, compared favorably to the combination of cisplatinine and gemcitabine. And the combination of this arginase inhibitor in combination with GEMSYS um, is under further investigation. Another very interesting drug is Vintrafosp alpha. This is a bifunctional antibody, uh, fusion protein targeting TGF beta and PDL1. And uh, in this early phase two study, uh, has showed a objective response rate of 10% per RISIS 1.1. Phase 2, 3 study evaluating uh, being trafosp alpha and chemotherapy as a first-line therapy for biliary cancer has completed enrollment in the phase 2 portion and is currently ongoing. There are many other exciting uh, combinations are being evaluated in biliary cancer. Here is a limited list of studies evaluating immune therapy combination. So now let's look at the treatment option slide that was presented earlier in, in the talk. And you can see now we have an expanding list of options for first-line treatment of advanced biliary cancer. Gemcitabine cisplatinine um, is the standard therapy based on data from ABCO2 study. Now, the Topaz-1 study support the combination of the Valumab plus gemcitabine and cisplatin. In addition, the remaining chemotherapy combinations have shown activity in this disease. In the subsequent line therapy, now all biliary cancer patients should have molecular profile. And if they carry genetic alterations of uh, that may lead to therapeutic agents such as IDH1 inhibitors, FGF1 inhibitors. And if tumor do not have those genetic alterations, the current standard chemotherapy is 4-FOX. There is another a promising chemo combination uh, where has been evaluated in biliary cancer. 
This is liposomal arenal TCAN um, in combination with 5-FU leucoworm. The phase 2 data was presented at ASCO 2021. And um, the combination of liposomal arenal TCAN plus 5-FU leucoworm showed a, a promising PFS of 7.1 months in comparison to 1.4 months in 5-FU leucoworm treated on. So this regimen also is an interesting option for patients with biliary cancer in the second line setting. Now let's come back to the, the case I presented earlier. This patient was treated with the Valumab plus gemcitabine cisplatin. The dose of gemcitabine cisplatin was reduced due to myelosuppression and uh, gemcitabine cisplatin was discontinued after eight cycles of therapy. Patient continued to receive the Valumab treatment. You can see on the left side of the slide, you see the baseline slide. Patient has a significant tumor shrinkage, which is durable 18 months later. So in conclusion, immune checkpoint inhibitors have shown promising activity as monotherapy or in combination, which are being validated in additional clinical studies. TOPE has one study, a randomized phase three trial, met its primary endpoint at pre-specified interim analysis. The value mass plus gemcitabine cisplatin demonstrated a significant and clinically meaningful prolonged over survival compared to placebo plus gemcitabine cisplatin. The value map did not add additional toxicities to that observed with gemcitabine cisplatin, and no new signal, safety signal were identified from known safety profile of each individual treatment. Biliary cancer are genetically heterogeneous with many potentially targetable genetic alterations. Participating in clinical trial is highly encouraged to identify effective treatment for patients with biliary cancer. Now I want to introduce Nanette to you. Nanette um, was diagnosed with stage four biliary cancer in October of 2018. She did not have typical symptoms of biliary cancer. She was participating in a drug study and blood work showed elevated liver counts that led to the diagnosis, eventually led to the workup and diagnosis of her biliary cancer. At the time of diagnosis, surgery was not an option. In 2019, she was treated with the standard first-line therapy, cisplatin plus gemcitabine. With disease progression in 2020, she was treated with Y90 radio embolization. With disease progression, she now enrolled in a clinical trial in 2021. Now let's welcome Lynette. Thank you for attention to my presentation. Being on the clinical trial um, provided me a lot of hope. Um, it was also a lot easier than some of my previous treatments, so that was a blessing. But to be um, involved in something that I had so many people involved and invested in my well-being, it's always a comforting feeling. Um, and I just, you know, I'm hoping for more time and more quality of life. And uh, it certainly has provided that. So I'm very grateful for that. And uh, at some point, when if I need another clinical trial, I will go in with the same attitude, I hope, and um, embrace it. And, you know, be thankful for the, the researchers and the medical teams that are making this all possible. All right, great. Well, that was a, a very uh, nice summary. Uh, a lot of data being presented uh, and some very inspirational videos. So why don't we get, I've got a whole list of questions here. If anybody here in the audience has questions, please type them into your iPad. So these are going to be open for our panelists. Um, we'll start with sequencing of FGFR inhibitors um, for second line therapy uh, with patients who have the fusion but may have received a combination chemotherapy and immunotherapy in the frontline setting. So would you still consider what would be the next step in those patients? Uh, I think the question is, uh, uh, the patient has progressed after, say, frontline chemoimmuno. Yep. We have yep. FGFR fusion, and what would we do next? You got uh, it. 
I think clearly, you know, we have two FDA approved agents. As Dr. Borat mentioned, we may have another. So we will use one of those. Um, the choice between a uh, reversible uh, ATP binding agent versus a covalent inhibitor can be dependent on experience. I probably would choose one of these agents at this time, uh, such as infogratinib or pebigatinib. Pebi uh, follow the patient closely, as Dr. He mentioned, at the sign of progression, perhaps consider a rebiopsy or a liquid biopsy uh, that might guide the next step. All right, any of the others on the panel have anything different? No, oh, we would concur that that <clears throat> makes the most sense. Great. Yes, I agree. What about the Topaz data one that was, that was presented today? Do you expect that Dervalumab will be incorporated in the first line regimen immediately? or are you still gonna wait for FDA approval? And then would you stop GEMSYS after the six months done in, uh, that was presented in the study? Um, the, the, um, so Topaz one met the primary endpoint. I, I do, uh, the data is currently under review. I think we would wait for the FDA approval um, to, to, to get this treatment covered by insurance. Um, uh, What's, your, 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 what's the second part of the question? Would you stop GEMSYS after six months oh. as done in the study? So that, that was a discussion point at the, today's presentation in the afternoon. Um, so um, the, this, well, I, I think according to study, we, uh, we stopped the therapy at uh, six months. And that still need to, I think, future data hopefully we will uh, address the question, should, should those, do patients do better with, uh, when, if you continue GEMSYS beyond six months? Um, I think another point, another point was made during today's presentation in the afternoon is um, I think with the immunotherapy combination, do we, have to, do we have to really extend chemotherapy beyond six months? Maybe this is a way of decreased chemotoxicities. How about Dr. Borat or Dr. Javli? You, do you stop the gem cyst then and just keep them on the, the dur Durva? Yeah, I mean, uh, there'll be variations in practice patterns. Um, <clears throat> uh, we wouldn't know at six months if somebody's responding to the Durva. You saw that there's a tail of about 20, per <clears throat> 20 odd percent at two years. Um, so uh, in the US, I feel the practice is often to continue to a progression uh, or intolerance. So, um, Dr. Roka, you were at another meeting earlier and we had this, this discussion. I think we are going to feel our way through this. If the patient has very aggressive disease, the patient has, for instance, massive bulky carcinomatosis or uh, some situation which, which would be an impending disaster uh, if the disease progresses, uh, perhaps we might continue the chemo a little bit longer and make sure that, you know, that if the disease is under control. Um, and there are situations where I would be very comfortable mm -hmm. with, for instance, hepatic disease with no impingement of major organs, where perhaps the discontinuation of chemotherapy would be perfectly fine. Um, I, I honestly think we are going to learn how to use this sequencing uh, with, with, within the parameters of each patient. And staying with you, Dr. Javli, you know, we heard a little bit about the subgroup analyses in the Asian versus the non-Asian patients. I know you've done some very elegant work with our partners in China looking at the different mutational profiles between East and West. Do you think that has anything to do with the results that we're finding, and how would you interpret that data in that context? I definitely think so, uh, Flavio. You have, uh, and you, you know, you have seen patients there. I think the disease burden is different in Asia in the sense there's more disease. Uh, the etiology of the disease is different. So clearly there's going to be a difference in, difference in uh, immune microenvironment. We have demonstrated there's, there's a different genetic pattern in the um, somatic genetic burden in the Asians versus the Western patients. So it follows there's going to be a difference in the immune profile as well. Um, but I'm glad that we are now finally highlighting immune heterogeneity of this tumor. And whereas we know much about genetic heterogeneity, we don't know a lot about immune heterogeneity. So we need to study that within the context. And this Topaz study has highlighted 
our deficiency in knowledge in addressing this, this issue. Excellent. Now here's a good question that just popped up. If you progress on one FGFR drug, do you switch to the other one? Uh, Maybe we discussed Borat. that a little bit in, the, um, in, in some of the comments during the talks. Uh, if a patient was on infogratinib and, or pemigatinib, there's a lot more escape mechanisms with polyclonal FGFR mutations, and frutibatinib could be considered there, or drugs like the RLY4008 uh, and others, which could overcome those resistance mutations. Uh, vice versa will be less common if somebody progresses on frutibatinib, I think using pemigatinib or infragatinib will typically not make sense. Rest of the panel, agree, concur? All right, nobody wants to go out on a limb. No, uh, I, I, I totally agree with Mitesh, and it's interesting now, we have done these studies for many years. One of the advocates, uh, and she wouldn't mind me mentioning it at all, Patty Corcoran of the, the Colangia Foundation, she actually was treated with four FGFR inhibitors, one sequentially after another, until eventually she developed an NRAS mutation. So when these mutations occur, secondary mutations, KRAS, PI3 kinase, CDK, and or some of these that cannot be targeted, that represents a terminal event, unfortunately. Again, highlighting why we need to follow them with liquid biopsies. Shifting gears a bit, because I know we tend to focus a lot on uh, cholangiocarcinoma, but what about patients who have gallbladder cancer? Should we automatically be testing for ERBB2 amplifications? And in what setting? Localized, metastatic, for anyone, Dr. Heat, perhaps. Um, I would uh, profile those patients. And um, I think currently we usually get the whole panel. Um, and I think, uh, well, currently we, uh, unless it, we're doing a clinic, uh, new adjuvant clinical trial, I think for, for resectable patients, uh, we, we currently we are not profiling those patients uh, unless they, are, they have recurred and we need to give them systemic therapy. I think you're then I would profile. Again, highlights, um, Dr. He, I, I concur with her completely, but then we need the surgeon, surgical community then to push us, perhaps with neoadjuvant ERBB2 therapies uh, for gallbladder cancer, for instance. Uh, so I think there would be increasing role with time. Yeah, I would add that uh, not to think only of HER2, but to think of um, even less frequent alterations. You will yeah. see them if you profile enough. So multi-analyte profiling, not single gene testing would be the, the guidance. No, that's a very good point, Dr. Borad. Yeah, we, we tend to do that for our patients, our resected patients. And I think what Dr. He was referring to is the ECOG uh, trial being led by my colleague, Dr. Shisher Maythel, for um, incidental gallbladder cancers, randomizing patients to perioperative uh, gem cysts versus uh, surgery and adjuvant gem cysts. So yes, yeah, so please, um, uh, those patients come, you know, uh, in rare uh, instances. So please uh, think of us when you uh, when you have a patient. Now shifting gears a little bit as we're winding down to let's say the the majority of the patients that we do see, which means those are the ones that don't have mutations or perhaps aren't candidates for cisplatin-based therapy. What does this expert panel um, recommend for those patients that unfortunately can't fit into these categories and can't get the standard or the, the new novel molecular therapy? So I think Dr. He highlighted very well that one possible option here is immunotherapy. And unfortunately, only, uh, you know, although 40% of intrahepatic cholangios have actionable mutations, uh, half of them don't. And then the number in extrahepatic and gallbladder is much lower so finally, it's exciting that perhaps these non, uh, these patients without actionable mutations may perhaps have this option with immunotherapy now in, off, in the frontline setting. Dr. He, uh, do you have any comments? Uh, yes, I, I currently, uh, there are many clinical trials that are testing different immune combinations. I think, um, I think that those patients are really encouraged to be enrolled in those clinical trials. So then we, um, especially with the combination immunotherapy studies. Great, and I think just the last question here and free for the panel, 
what future clinical trials do you want to see in this disease? Pie in the sky. There's going to be more immunotherapy for sure um, to allow the curves to shift upward instead of sideways. Uh, this, the Topaz trial clearly uh, is uh, paramount in that. And instead of, you know, what trials, we want to see more patients on trials, and that will help drive the field forward. That's a great point, Mitesh. I would like to see more of multimodality trials to see how immune profiling and, and molecular alterations will guide our surgeons. I personally feel, for instance, FGFR patients may have a different paradigm for surgery than we use for KRAS patients, for instance. Uh, in other words, I, I, I would love to see a multimodality treatments which incorporate targeted therapy and immunotherapy. Couldn't agree with you more, Milan. Dr. Um, yes. Um, so I, I think uh, finally we, 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 we're going to get getting close to uh, getting more effective treatment with this new, new new therapy, new combinations to downstage patients. And I think we do have a lot of, uh, we see a lot of patients on resectable bulky disease, per, like periportal lymph nodes. I think now this is a, a good time to bring effective systemic therapy to earlier stage and try to downstage those patients for cure. Great. Well, I think we're actually just a little bit over. I think uh, I want to obviously thank our esteemed panelists for a great lecture, a great discussion. Uh, again, it's an exciting time to be in biliary tract cancer. And I think if we can get the last slide there, just to get folks, there you go. Um, so again, visit us uh, at uh, peerview.com, biliary SF22. Please submit your post-test evaluation for credit uh, so you can get your CME. And uh, we'll do this all again tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>